So typically we uh, have our communion and our offering time at, at the beginning, but uh, because of what we're speaking about today, because of the theme of our services for the last, last couple of s- sermons, uh, b- being a stranger and an alien, uh, what, what does that mean, to be a stranger and alien? D- I mean, does it, it means to be what? Different on the moon, maybe not. Maybe, maybe that, maybe that's true. But, but to be a stranger or an alien, Peter has talked about a lot of things, about how living for God, getting rid of debauchery we talked about last week. Uh, what, isn't that a fun word, debauchery? It's a terrible thing, but, but it's those things of, of living and acting differently. And, and so this week is no different uh, up to this point, Peter has been kind of holding back. He, he's kind of been tackling some tough options, but, but today, today is going to be the day where he is going to drop the, the, the mighty Jesus elbow on, on every one of us. This is the time when we're going to start talking about something that affects each and every one of us. Because with debauchery, there are a few of us who can say, I have never been involved in debauchery. What do you, whatever that means. It sounds terrible, but kind of fun to say. But, but, but wicked thinking and deceitful speech, and there, there, there are, in fact, people in here that have never said a bad thing about anyone ever, out loud. <laughs> but but today's, today we're going to talk about something that everybody struggles with at one point or another, and that is absolutely suffering. Peter tackles this topic of suffering in such a fashion that no one is left out. Who here has never suffered? Raise your hand. No one. Who here has suffered unjustly for any reason? Raise your hand. For no reason you have suffered there's a lot of hands that went down. They're like, eh, yes. <laughs> Who here has suffered because you've deserved it? <laughs> Everybody leaves them up a little higher that time. <laughs> yeah, I did that. Let's see, honesty is a part of it too. Well, because of suffering, there's a lot of things in life that are different. Because we, see, we look at suffering in so many different aspects of our lives. We look at suffering as something has been removed from my life, so therefore I suffer. I am in physical pain, therefore I suffer. I am in psychological pain, mental pain, emotional pain. I, I, I suffer. Something has separated itself from me, and I suffer. Someone else is hurting, and I suffer. And most of us, especially, especially Christians, we think, you know, we picked something different. We picked a better life. We picked to choose and follow Christ. And, and have you or have, not, have you not heard this statement from anybody who doesn't believe in God? Why would a good God let bad things happen to good people? Have you guys ever heard that before? Why would, God, why would a good God let people suffer? Today, Peter's going to talk about that. So if you came here looking for an answer to that question, today is your lucky day, because <laughs> we're going to talk about it. Uh, I'm, I'm going to go ahead and read through the text today. Um, hopefully you all have your Bibles out and ready to go in, in 1 Peter chapter 4, verses 12. If not, I'm going to have it up on the screen for you. So just go ahead and read along with me, or follow along with me. You guys can see that? Okay. Peter starts out talking like this. Dear friends... Do not be surprised at the painful trials you are suffering. Some of your translations may say a fiery ordeal. As though something strange were happening to you. But rejoice that you participate in the suffering of Christ, so that you may be overjoyed when his glory is revealed. If you are insulted because of the name of Christ, you are blessed for the spirit of glory and of God rests on you. If you suffer... It should not be as a murderer or a thief or any other kind of criminal or even as a meddler. 
However, if you suffer, why didn't that not change? We change that? Thank you. However, if you suffer as a Christian, do not be ashamed, but praise God that you bear that name, for it is time for judgment to begin with the family of God. And if it begins with us, what will the outcome be for those who do not obey the gospel of God? And, and if it's hard for the righteous to be saved, what will become of the ungodly and the sinner? So then those who suffer according to God's will should commit themselves to their faithful creator and continue to do good. He gave us a really great list right here. And, and I'm going I'm to break it down. I'm going to explain it to you like this. It's going to be the do's and the don'ts of suffering. So basically what I'm going to do is I'm going to give you the opportunity for you to understand and know how to suffer correctly for Jesus. <laughs> Okay, so all right, let's get started with the do nots. Okay, the don'ts. Do not be surprised. Peter tells us in first in verse twelve. He says, "Don't be surprised at the painful trials you are suffering, as if something strange were happening to you." Now, I, I gotta, I gotta tell you guys, I read this, and, and it it hit me hard. I was like, wait, but. Uh, who writes this stuff? <laughs> Peter did. But he's saying, don't be surprised. And I was, in fact, surprised. I was surprised that, that people have ostracized me in the past because I love Jesus. I, I was surprised uh, when I got called goody two-shoes. And you don't know me. You can't understand me. You're good or you're holier than thou or... You have a family, or I mean, any of those things. Take, take your pick. I was surprised because I was persecuted. I was surprised that my life sometimes gets hard. I, I, there are times in my life where I think, it's, life has got to be easier than this somewhere. I mean, there has got to be a place in life where bills just get paid. My children just do good things. They, they don't get into trouble. They get good grades. They say the right things and do the right things. Uh, the, the children in the youth group never have any issues that I have to, to, to scope out or deal with. Nobody in the church is, is forcing foreclosure or, or losing their home or needing a car because, or name it. And sometimes I get to a point where I think, why would a good God let bad things happen to so many good people? Does that ever happen with you guys? When you face somebody with a tragedy, you see that. Well, Peter says right here, duh, don't be surprised. You call yourself Christian, this is, this is part of being Christian. This is part of your life with God. It's going to get hard. But then he goes on and he says, don't be surprised. And then don't be a murderer. Now, when you look at that, that list, it doesn't really kind of make sense. But let me, let me explain it to you in, in, this, in this sense. Um, what happens when you get surprised by something? So there's a, a thrill of emotions, especially by a hard situation, especially suffering. You get surprised when you get impacted, when, when you get to a point where you feel like your life is... Um, in jeopardy in, in one facet or another. Do you, you get mad? Somebody else is, is, is suffering something unjustly, something that make you mad? And you get angry, and you want to stop it. And, and I think that's what Peter's talking about here. It's not just the physical, have malice in your heart and going off somebody. It's that hate that wells up inside of you. That, that hate against God. Back to that same question, why, does a good, why would you ask that question, why does a good God do stuff, let bad stuff happen? Where does that question lead to? Separation and anger from God. You're mad at God, you hate God. Didn't Jesus tell us, if you hate somebody in your heart, says if you already killed them, if you have angst against your brother, go and take care of it. Love your brother. These are the things we talk about when we talk about suffering when it comes to murder. Now, the, now the, the next part, 
a thief. Verse 15, he says this. Not as a criminal, or excuse me, a sufferer should not be as a murderer or a thief or any other kind of criminal. No. Has anybody ever had, known anybody that's gone to jail? Anybody at all? What's the first thing they say? I didn't do it. <laughs> not my fault. I'm mad. But, but as a thief, thief can mean that. It can mean, it can mean stealing other things. It can also mean stealing other people's time and energy. Especially when it comes to suffering. If everything in your life is a catastrophe, the people you turn to are going to be like, come on, nothing good goes on in your life? I couldn't find my socks this morning. Ah! My world is upside down. Or, or name it. You could be a thief of someone's time just as easily as you can be a thief of someone's possessions. You can also be a thief of your relationship with God and other people's relationship with God. And when it comes to suffering, and we talk about being a thief, have you ever heard this, say, this phrase? Oh, I know what that feels like. Oh, oh yes. I went through something just like that last week. And we, we try to re-navigate re, re and, and, and kind of re, turn, the, turn the vision back to ourselves. We're like, oh yes, I understand what you're saying. And we do it with the best of intentions. But when we're, when we're with a person who is suffering, who, who is feeling the pain and the regret, the last thing they need to hear is, I know what you're going through. No, you don't. You, you, you've, you didn't even know my mom or my dad or my uncle. You've never even been in a position where you haven't paid your taxes before. You, you've never had Sally Mae calling you 17 times a day, and your sister, and your brother, and your uncle, and your 16 ex-employers, and, and, and the ex-girlfriend from 15 years ago when you were still in high school just to try to track you down. You don't know what that's like. And yet you've turned it around, and you've stolen my opportunity to grieve. And that's an opportunity, and that, I believe that that is what Peter is getting to at the heart of this. But then in, in, in with, with the criminal, the same type of thing, that word from last week that I used, debauchery, bad things, always running amok. All, bear in mind that all of those things can be done with the very best of intentions or the very worst. You can be a criminal at church, and it doesn't have to be bad hearts or, or misconstrued. You can, you can pervert crimes against your fellow brother or sister with the best of intentions. Does that make sense? The road to hell is paved on good intentions. <laughs> it's, it's absolutely true. Don't be like that, Peter says. Don't live your life like that. And then out of nowhere, he says this. He says, don't be a meddler. Do you, do you guys know what a meddler is? The, the, the busybody stuff? I, I, I was very enamored with this word because it didn't make sense inside of this list. We got murderer, we got thief, we got criminal, we got meddler. That seems like a pretty low-level issue, wouldn't you think? Peter didn't think so. Peter felt that this meddler, this meddling right here, was just as destructive as a murderer, or a thief, or a criminal. Same thing. And so I looked it up, and here's the, here's the Greek word for it. So next time you see someone meddle in your business, use this word. Alatripiscopus. Say that three times fast. Alatripiscopus. <laughs> well, half of you are having fun. <laughs> But here's the, that, that, now that's the Greek word for meddler, and here's the, here's the definition. A person who oversees another person's affairs specifically concerning Gentiles. Don't forget that last part. Now, if you don't know what a Gentile is, a Gentile is anybody who isn't Jewish. So if you didn't know, is there anybody Jewish in here? 
we are all Gentiles. <laughs> all right. But have you guys ever, ever, you guys ever noticed that the, the busybody who's always, well, my, well, my so and so, my neighbor, insert, insert statement and person here. Uh, he's always doing this, or he's always doing that. I try to get him to come to church. He just never does this. And oh my gosh, last night he was having a party till 3 a.m. And, and the, there was noisy music, and there was cars out, and everybody. And then I saw him, and oh my gosh, Gladys, do you have any idea of who he was hanging out with yesterday? Oh my Lord. <laughs> that gossip and meddling thing, that fits so tightly together. And it leads to so many other things. That's why being a meddler is up there on that list. Because it is just as dangerous. It is just as deadly as if you murdered someone. Because what's worse, you could murder the heart of your brother or sister or somebody who doesn't know Jesus and burn a bridge that someone could use to find Christ. So though we think of meddling as something that's not a big deal. In Peter's eyes, it was serious. The next thing, don't be ashamed. What do you think Peter meant by that? Don't be ashamed. It's in verse 16. If anybody's got their Bible open. Anybody? Anybody? If you suffer as a Christian, don't be ashamed. But praise God that you bear that name. Don't be ashamed to call yourself Christian. Don't be ashamed when somebody calls you a holy, roll, holy rolling, hard knocking, for spirit filled Jesus freak. Say thank you. Be excited. I love it when people call me a Jesus freak. You're one of those Jesus freaks. I'm like, praise! Yes! Thank you! Because that means that something inside of my character has spilled out and they were able to see that. And so they identified me as something different, as a stranger, as something that's foreign to them. And the only thing that they can use to explain that is, well, you're freaky. You're freaky. Do you want to be freaky, church? Do you want to be foreign? Do you want to be made fun of? Do you want to have that opportunity for what Jesus has put inside of you to spill out so that someone looks at you and goes, you're a freak. We want that. We want to look weird to the world because if we look like the world, we miss the point. Now with the point of all of this, let's talk about the do's. Do rejoice with suffering. Have any of you rejoiced when you suffer? Tell me something. Somebody tell me something, the last thing that they suffered through. One thing. Anybody. Nobody suffered through anything. Ruptured Achilles tendon. Ruptured Achilles tendon. Did you, did, were you happy about that? No. <laughs> I, I, I can relate with that. I've snapped both of mine. And, and, and not at the same time. So I, 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 you're right. You're right. No, I, I, was, I was saying I have also done that to you. Not to him. I can relate with that. You guys are good. <laughs> Which, yeah, that's, that's good. Do rejoice with when you suffer. Verse 13. Hey, John, do you want to preach? Huh? Oh, okay. <laughs> rejoice that you participate in the sufferings for Christ. Rejoice that you suffer. That, that very statement right there is foreign to my heart. It is foreign to my actions. It is foreign to my beliefs. It is foreign to how I, I function as a human being here on earth. 
That statement right there, rejoice that we suffer. Or during, yeah. But Peter, but Peter wants us to know, he's like, you know what, rejoice that you go through hard times. Be glad about it. And then he says, do be overjoyed. This one really got me, guys. I, I, I got to tell you, I don't know that there is one time in my life I have ever been overjoyed during, before or after I was suffering. Not once have I been overjoyed. But Peter says, do be overjoyed. <laughs> I've been underjoyed. But he said, be overjoyed because you suffer with Christ. You suffer in those same footsteps. Be glad that you are worthy to be able to take on that role. Could any of you take these two statements, just these two, and go outside of this church, find somebody who does not believe in Jesus, and tell them these two things, and they would accept Christ? Or would they look at you like you were nuts? Because it's opposite to the world. It's opposite. It's completely backwards. And that's why Peter's saying it. That's why Jesus had us the, here on earth to follow him. Is that right there? To be different than the world. To love the fact that we love something that is bigger than ourselves. Be overjoyed. And he says, do praise God that you bear the name Christian. Now, now how many, Christian, the word Christian is only used three times in the New Testament. In, in this context. Now it says Christians, Christianos. Uh, th there are other paraphrases, but, but in this specific fashion, it's only used three times. And it's, it's, it's expressing the word uh, uh, in a derogatory fashion. And, and in this, the Christian word in Greek was Christianos. And it was used as a slang reference to make fun of people who originally called themselves the believers. But then it got to a point where they're like, okay, you guys can make fun of me with this? I'll be a Christian. Because that's kind of suffering for Christ. I'm a Christ follower. Christianos, in fact, means follower of Christ. And the reason that they, the reason that they were made fun of by this is because it is, well, that's not it. Where is it? Oh, there it is. Um, uh, in the Greek culture, the Greek cultures, they worshipped Caesar. Caesar was known as their godhead. They're the one who they paid homage to in tithes and offerings. And so they called themselves Kaisarianos. It's a Greek word. It means a follower of, of Caesar. Kaisarianos. I am a Kaisar. American. America. You're not. You're not American. There's lots of there's there's lots of things that we could bring over into into today's culture with this one of where we identify ourselves or maybe this. I go to Willamina Christian Church. You're a Methodist. I go to the Lutheran Church. Crossroader. I'm not saying that's okay or I approve of any of that, but you know what happens. I'm from Willow Mina, you share tonight, Ian. Er. Those, are, those are Grand Ronders. Those are, those are Salemites. Those are backheads. I mean, you know, there, there's always that. There's always that separation. And, and though you're using it to identify a specific person in a specific place, in a specific culture, you say it, half-heartedly at best, but there's a derogatory statement inside of that. You're poking fun. You're, me you're making fun of them. Christians, the word, every time you say Christians, in the Greek culture, you're making fun of yourself. As well as other people. Did you guys know that? You're making fun of yourselves. Can you think of anybody else who takes a derogatory term and accepts it as, their, as, as who they are as a person? 
and 2,000 years later, still call themselves that? Not me. What's that? Yankee Doodle. Oh. That, that, always, that always makes me think of chicken noodle soup. I don't know why. <laughs> Every time I hear Yankee Doodle, I think, oh, chicken noodle soup sounds so good right now. I'm sorry. That's, it's, it's really like every time I hear that, I think, oh, I think it's the crackers. But yeah, Yankee Doodle. Um, how, how, we used to, how we used to refer to African Americans? 1915, 1920, 1930, 1960. Do you remember what we used to call them? Please don't repeat it. That derogatory statement we used to use to refer to them. It was derogatory. It had spite in it. When it left your lips, there was a negative attribute to it. I've been called these lots of times. Prairie neighbor. Spear chucker. Because I'm Native American. I've been called those things a lot. Think of any other culture you've been to. Like, the, it's all out there, ladies and gentlemen. Wetback, spink, chick. Name it. There are lots of things that we have heard or our culture uses to tear somebody else down. To elevate yourself into such a fashion that we seem better than you and we belong and you don't. And yet Peter says, you know what? We're not going to do that. We're going to take the very thing that you call us and we're going to say, okay, call us Christian. Yep, I'm a Christian. That means I'm a follower of Christ and I'm proud of that. And I will stand in direct opposition of your derogatory statement. And I'll say thank you. Isn't it great? I'm a follower of Christ. I'm saved by the blood of Jesus. So I will call myself a Christian and thank you for doing so. You think that turned grease on its ear? That's different. That's strange. I was calling you a name and you said thank you and you're jumping up and down singing praises? What is that, Psalm 23 you were just singing? I think something about David? What's going on? I don't understand. How could you be so happy that I just called you a name? And Peter says, rejoice. Be glad that you get to be called this. Be glad someone sees you because Jesus has leaked out of you into your life. Verse 17, he kind of finishes it off and he says, you know what? Do prepare for judgment. Because this book was written in between 60 and 65 A.D., and, and Peter says this, for the time of judgment, for it is time for the judgment to begin with the family of God. Any of us waiting around for the judgment to begin? Too late. It's already started. And because it's already started, what's going to happen to the rest of the world? Because if it's a struggle for us, if we don't know how to suffer correctly, if we have a hard time doing life here on earth just like everybody else, and we look like everybody else, yet we call ourselves to be something different, how does that look to the non-believer? What's going to happen to them because they have no hope? Their hope is tied up in their money or their car or their children or their wife or their husband. Their faith is focused on something that will perish. What's going to happen to them when the time of judgment comes? What's going to happen to the woman who wakes up every day to live her life for her? But wait, what happens to the man who wakes up every day and lives his life for the pursuit of money? Stuff. New boat, new quad, new car, new girlfriends, new lifestyle, new house, name it. Atheists have this favorite saying is I don't believe in a God, and I'll tell you what, they're lying. 
God put a God-shaped hole inside of each and every one of us. And that hole inside of us will be filled with something. Because we suffer. Because we're lonely. Because we live in this world and we can see that something's not quite right. Especially this side of the cross. This side of the cross, we fill that hole inside of us that, that Paul talks about in Romans. We fill that up with Jesus. We, we, we put that puzzle piece of God back into our lives and things start to make sense to us. We see things clearer and more differently. But the people this side of the cross, people that haven't found their relationship with Jesus yet, their lives are muddled. And they have to fill that void with something. Because everybody has to have something to hope for. Something to worship. Something to love. Even if it's imaginary. Because if they don't, what happens? They suffer. That lonely anguish. That separation. That that heartless life of not knowing anybody or anything that is powerful enough to just comfort you when you need to be comforted. And so it gets filled with stuff. And the last thing, do commit yourself to a faithful creator. Focus your life on the things that last. When life starts to get hard, be thankful, be overjoyed that you have a God who was always there no matter what. From the beginning of time, he has been there for you. You are here because God is a faithful God. He always follows through. He'll never let you down. God will always finish the rest of the story. When we come down to it, why do we suffer? Peter said it was to glorify God. We suffer to glorify God. C.S. Lewis was asked this question. Somebody backed him into a corner and said, C.S., could you stop talking to Prince Caspian for a minute? Come over here by the wardrobe. I need to ask you something. He said, C.S. Lewis, why do you think Christians suffer? And he looks at him and he says, why do I think Christians suffer? Because <laughs> we're the only ones that can take it. Why? Because we have a God inside of us. We, we have a God to worship. We have a place that we're going. We know the end of the story, ladies and gentlemen. Satan loses. Jesus wins. We know that. We see it and we experience every single day. Why do I think we suffer? Because I believe that we have no right to expect better treatment from this world than Jesus did. Have you guys ever seen The Passion of Christ? Have you ever heard stories? Read, read scripture where he talks about how Jesus was whipped and beaten and tortured and put on a cross? and given vinegar wine. His clothes were gambled for, and he was ashamed and embarrassed that somebody took the time and opportunity to pick a murderer over him to be sentenced to death. Set the murderer free. Kill that guy. You want to talk about fair? That's what Jesus got. Is that fair? The only person on this world to ever live a perfect life the perfect sacrifice. Got beaten, got whipped, got tortured. You want to talk about suffering? He suffered for no good reason. Not because of anything he did, not because of anything he said, not because of anything he heard. He took every single one of our sins, past, present, present, and future, and said, you know what? I will take this. I will suffer all of this for you. And we have the right to suffer and be miserable today at the circumstances we're going through. 
encourage you next time. Next time you, you start going through a difficult time, I want you to stop and think. Am I suffering as much as Jesus did? Do I have the right to complain about my situation based on what Jesus did? Because I call myself a Christian, because I say I'm a follower of Christ, because I am supposed to celebrate and be overjoyed and rejoice in the fact that I am a Christian and I am suffering something, because Jesus said that's what's, what's going to happen. Don't expect better treatment than I did. Ladies and gentlemen, he never said a single time that it was going to be easy to be a Christian and follow Christ. He just said it would be worth it. It's worth it because we know the end of the story. Stay faithful. Stay committed. Be different. Be strange. Be foreign and be alien. Be weird to the culture around you. I want to challenge you with this. I want you, this week, I want you to challenge being made fun of. I'm going to challenge you to rejoice when you get hurt by someone else's actions. I want you to celebrate being taken advantage of. I want you to be overjoyed with the hard stuff that forces us to our knees. Suffering does two things. It gets us to a place where we can look up. And it forces us to rely on God. We see God show up when we've got nothing left. Why do we suffer? Why do we suffer? Let's pray. Father God, I thank you for the opportunity to be here today to share your word. Father, it's not easy. Nothing about your, the walk of your life, Lord, is easy. But God, I pray that you will be with us every single day, that you will comfort us when we get to our breaking point. God, when we suffer, I pray that you will give us the opportunity to rejoice, to be overjoyed, and to be weird, to be different from our culture. Father God, we love you and we thank you, and it's in his name we pray. Amen.